it off. 11.30, there we go. You're going to press the record. Oh, we have recorded. Well, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, lovely to see so many people here early in the morning. Um, so biplanes was the thing I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, ostensibly rigging, but I thought while we're talking biplanes, I'd talk um, another couple of things um, as we go. Uh, just little techniques I've evolved or I've stolen, found on the internet um, over the years. Um, the first one, um, before we get to rigging, uh, in assembly for biplanes, um, I've been building, uh, actually, I'm going to swap cameras. Um, started off doing uh, relatively uh, straight out of the box uh, work with fairly mainstream kits, uh, your Edwards, your Rodens, and uh, on the whole, I found that those things uh, go together nicely. And they don't need a lot of um, fettling or TLC. They, you know, they're, they're pretty much the Tamiers of biplanes. They go together well. Uh, but when you start uh, work with um, slightly more, less mainstream things, um, working at the moment, let's see, where's the camera pointing? They're on a Blue Max Avro 504. Uh, these things are far more um, your typical uh, cottage builds. So as you can see, there's your instructions. Uh, they really do expect that um, you've built a couple of models and you're going to build them yourself. Um, as you'll note, there are, in fact, no text instructions. <laughs> they just say, build it like this. And here's some colour notes and a couple of notes on the decals. And there's some colour schemes you might want to pick up. So they really do expect, um, this is essentially the instructions, make it look like this, uh, that you're going to, um, you, you've got uh, good reference material. And um, uh, these uh, WinSoft data files are absolutely the duck's nuts as far as um, biplane references go. Uh, there really is nothing to beat them on the market. They are the thing. Uh, they're fairly rare these days. I don't know if they're still in production or whether they just come out at such a, a slow rate that um, they may as well not be. So secondhand is the way to go. And I know a bunch of us were lucky enough a few years ago um, in Melbourne to find at the, the big Melbourne Expo. Um, a store off to one side, it was the Aviation Historical Society, had a cardboard box under their table, and a couple of people were flicking through the box and said, oh my God, there's windsock data files in this thing. And we pulled out about 50 of the buggers, and uh, uh, they got consumed very, very quickly, um, uh, like a whirlwind. But that was uh, fabulous to build up those uh, reference libraries. So I know that there's a bunch of guys around the society who have got really good libraries of these uh, data socks. Uh, wind socks data files um, so if you're embarking on a, pro a biplane project that you don't have much reference for um, just put the word out you know, people are, are very generous i'm sure people would be happy for you to um, have a look at one of their collection so um, working on this blue max avro 504 i'm just trying to work out where it is as far as the camera goes there she is um, i don't know what type of resolution the camera is going to give us um it's coming across good oh lovely so anyway there she is um most of this has gone together quite nicely this is the the model as as per the kit uh but a couple of things you'll see that on most of these world war one airplanes uh the wing sections are very very thin indeed you know there's not a lot of plastic meat there to um help when it comes to assembly so i'm in the habit of uh, reinforcing uh, the wing roots of all of my more recent biplanes with little bits of brass section. So um, the brass stuff, I've got a, quite a, a collection um, on my workbench. Um, very, very readily available. Um, it used to be K and, K and B or K and S, I think. Uh, but now Albion Alloys provide it in um, all the uh, different sizes that you could possibly want. There's some 0.8 mil and I've got 0.6 mil and 1 mil and alloy tubes, etc. So little bits of um, brass rod like that for reinforcing uh, are fabulous. Um, brass rod, a collection of um, your tiny little twist drills. And, of course, um, uh, the, um, the the drill chuck. Um, I've... I love tools. I spent far too much time and money on tools, and this is the one that I love the most. Um, I did buy one from Pete just recently, um, a, a, a little Manway one. It's nice, but 
Um, this guy, I can't even remember where I picked it up, probably 20 years ago, um, is incredibly precise and it feels really good in the hand. So it's my go-to drill. Uh, so drilling into that plastic, it does take a little bit of nerve because the plastic's only a mil or two thick. Um, so you do need to take your time, go slow, don't use a power tool, just use a twist drill. And I find it's always handy to start um, your drill bit off with the point of a scalpel. Uh, just find the piece of plastic that you're going to be drilling into. Very, very carefully apply the tip of the knife to where you want it. Hold it in position. Twist it a couple of times, just enough to open out a tiny little dimple, which will be enough to catch the top of the drill as you finally actually start twisting into the plastic. Um, once you've done it a few times, it's second nature, and it only takes seconds. It takes far longer to describe it than it does to actually do it. Um, and you're then pretty confident that that um, joint along the wing root there is going to be strong and also the joints between the panels and the centre sections are also going to be strong and they're going to hold up for the life of the model, um, which is a really nice thing. Um, something else I found um, as I move into the more esoteric subjects and the smaller cottage industry producers is that to some degree you're um, left a little bit alone uh, when it comes to wing struts. And I know that that's one of the things that terrifies most modelers, um, and, and rightly so. You know, misaligning the wing um, leaves you with a, a you know, pretty ordinary subject. For example, this um, Blue Max thing, it's given us a little piece of, there is actually an airfoil section on that plastic, you won't be able to see it, but it's, it's there. But it's very weak, flimsy plastic strip and uh, well there aren't any instructions uh, other than they give you um, in here um, along here they tell you oh this is the length of those struts interplane struts there the rear skid struts the tailplane struts so they're giving you length and approximate width but that's about it so they leave you to do it so um a couple of subjects ago i i can't remember now i found it online or just invented this technique i hit upon a technique to build my own struts um, and here's one I prepared earlier. So um, this strut here, um, and it, it looks okay now, it's all painted up, it's got the wood grade on it, it's got the end fitting, is a piece of aluminium tube. So um, what we do is take a section of this um, aluminium tube, and for a, a model of this type of size, 48 scale biplane, I'm likely to use um, about two mil tube uh, from Albion, something like that. And running down the guts of that tube is a piece of 0.5 mil brass wire. So I cut the brass wire uh, one and a half, two centimetres longer than the aluminium tube. The aluminium tube, of course, is cut precisely to the length that I want the strut to be. Um, and then I take the whole lot up to the shed and uh, clamp it in the jaws of a machine vise that's uh, faced with a couple of bits of aluminium strip so that you don't get the, the crinkling of the jaws and then just squash the bugger. Um, some, something about physics says that the piece of brass wire tends to end up in the middle of the tube um, and it tends to be straight and you just crush it, put a really good squeeze on it, that flattens it out till that aluminium tube is pretty bloody close to the uh, thickness of the kit plastic, but it's infinitely stronger and it's got that bit of brass wire pigtail that runs up the middle of it. The beauty of that, of course, is you can drill right through your wing and that strut will sit there beautifully in position, allowing you to get all eight struts, all eight struts um, lined up. Uh, that one's a little bit far forward, but it's just not glued at the moment. Get everything lined up loose, get the top wing on, then run around with super glue and a uh, tiny little drop on each hole um, and then come in underneath and snip off the pigtails um, and across the top wing and snip those off. The other beauty of that is that because these are metal, they're really, really strong. And because they've got a bit of brass wire running through the middle of them, they're actually quite pliable and flexible. So as far as getting your alignment goes, which is another thing which terrifies people when building biplanes, you can just reef the bloody thing, line it all up, 
get the wing glued together, have a look at it and say, oh, you know, my leading edge is a little bit far forward on this, you know, the wing's sitting a bit like that, bend it back into position and the metal will take that bend and hold it beautifully. No danger of anything cracking or splitting or letting go. Um, and you end up with uh, the inter wing joints being the strongest part of the model. Uh, which is lovely when it comes to handling. You can pick it up by the wingtip with no problems and flap it around and show people things. No danger at all of anything separating because it's all joined together by metal. So that's a technique that um, I'm quite quite proud of. It works really well. Um, is it the exact airfoil that the strut was? No, it's not. I don't care. <laughs> it looks like a strut. The wing is in position. It's at the right angle. It's... In, it's all aligned. Um, that's a technique that I really, really love. Um, I haven't used that technique um, unless I've needed to. So, you know, something um, delicate like this uh, Edward DH2, uh, the kit was um, modern enough and accurate enough that the kit supplied struts all just plugged into place. Um, so you just uh, d don't need the technique all the time. Just when you do, it's a really lovely technique to have in your kit bag to be able to um, rescue something which is pretty dodgy. Um, and it makes building these things viable and fun. So that's my strut technique, which I think is really useful. Um, so I guess moving on to rigging. So I've used lots of different types of, oh, hang on, well, I'll, I'll stop. Are there any questions at this point? Jerry, just a question on your tubing. Um, yes, right. Uh, what do you use to cut it? Ah, um, good question. The, the, this stuff, although it's metal, it's surprisingly soft. So um, I just use a larger style craft knife. Um, and the trick is not to try and push through, because if you push through, you'll squash it. But um, if I dig out a craft knife here, extend the blade a little bit. Um, can you see this all right? Yep. Put that there. Decide where you want the cut to go. And put a bit of pressure and just roll roll backwards and forwards and as you saw there that pinned off and does that work for, work for brass as well or? Uh, not as well uh, brass is a much harder surface material um if it, if i was going to do that for brass for a tube this diameter i'd go up to um uh, something like a stanley knife that's got a much stronger blade um the rigidity of these blades is pretty weak and they'd snap and you, you do need to be careful make sure you're wearing some type of um, protection. You know, I normally wear glasses, so that's okay. But, but same um, technique, just, just sharp blade and roll. And well, roll. yeah, if it's a brass tube, um, uh, yes, although if it was more than a couple of mil, yeah. I would be inclined to use um, a jeweler's saw. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I've got one of those up in the shed, and um, if you, you fashion the, uh, the little, I'm not sure what you call it, there's a, a special brace that you use with a jeweler's saw. It's essentially a rectangular piece that's got a V cut in it, yeah. and the saw cuts into that V, and you can hold the part quite precisely. And um, that's what I do for brass more than a couple of mil. Yep. Thanks. Right. Um, okay, well, let's um, continue on to the actual rigging. So um, this isn't my technique, it's just what I've adopted, and I love it to pieces, mm -hmm. is to use um, a material called easy line and you can use it on um oh, sorry guys i've got to try and work out where the camera is um you know quite complex subjects like this um i gave up counting the number of rigging lines in this bastard but there's a lot um to very simple little things i used it just last week on the little sock with pup the old 70 second scale airfix pup um that came together quite nicely for a you know, 50 year old kit um it's a lovely lovely material and I love it to pieces. I'm just about to run out of my first roll of the stuff. Um, there's the product, Easy Line. It was, um, I believe, invented by an American modeler for model railways. Um, uh, uh, Phil Hasty would tell you that um, if you're doing scenery around your model railway and you're doing uh, telegraph lines that run alongside the track or power lines or something, one of the bugbears of the diorama maker is because you need to reach over the track constantly to get to your models to reseat them on the track. Yet you're, you're continually snagging your fingers on the bloody power lines and telegraph lines that run along the side of the track. So um, this clever bloke said, well, that's a problem. Um, let's come up with the material 
and he invented this easy line stuff. And easy line is, I, I think it's a natural rubber, but I might be wrong, it might be in synthetic. And I don't know if you can see, no, it's too thin to see. Oh, no, you can see it there, like um, a bit of spider line coming off that. Um, that uh, has got beautiful stretch. Um, I'm stretching that all out to there. You can't tell, but I've stretched that about a meter um, for a, a four inch section. Uh, beautifully stretchy, beautifully resilient, will pop back into shape, which means it's just ideal for our biplanes because um, also when you're threading a biplane, it's very, very easy to catch it on your fingers to snarl it. And one of the difficult things about biplane rigging is getting some tension on the line so it doesn't sag. I know people have tried, you've probably tried using um, you know, things like this um, invisible darning thread, which is a, a, like a monofilament, uh, a very, very thin fishing line, or even just um, cotton thread. Uh, because there's no inherent stretch to these materials, uh, it really complicates your life because you've got to put enough tension on that material such that when you glue it off or tie it off, um, it, it stays straight, it doesn't sag and look pants. Um, and then you've got another uh, issue that you're dealing with, is as soon as you start putting tension, um, especially if you were to consider you know, a little 70 second skull piece of plastic like that, if there was all the tension in there, unless you get it exactly right, like the original prototype, you're gonna bend things and twist things out of shape. Um, so um, the beautiful thing about this easy line material is it avoids all of that neatly by not having any strength um, and being beautifully stretchy um, in the hand. It's just a, a marvelous material. It takes super glue really well, and that's the, the hub of, um, of the technique, uh, super glue. And the lovely thing is, um, if you use some imagination, um, you're not running you know, 20 different lines like on the sop with pup, you're running about four because the stuff can go from one position to a, another position, wrap around that and then continue on on its journey. So taking a few minutes of thought uh, before you start um, means you can plan out how many bits of this easy line you need. And then it's a simple case of going from A to B to C to D to E. All right, that's long enough, cut it off there and then do a second line. Okay, from G to H to I to J and cut it off. So rather than you know, 20 or 30 or 40 or you know, bloody God knows how many rigging operations, you've only got half a dozen. And it really is very relaxing. It gets knocked over. Um, you know, one evening typically is you know, more than enough for especially a small scale model like this. So a couple of tools I've evolved to help with the job. Um, applying small amounts of super glue because super glue is what I use um, in precise positions is um, always interesting and um, little bits of balsa um, or you know any, anything a toothpick for example with a little bit of fused wire on the end jammed into it means that I can hold that a bit like a paintbrush dip into a palette pick up a dot of super glue and apply it very 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 precisely to exactly where I want that dot of glue to go um, no danger of flooding or missing. Um, and even if you do miss, you've only got a, a 0.2 of a mil dot of glue that a, a drop of paint will hide. So a little precision tool like that to allow you to apply the glue is great. And then the other, other real magic tool is these little buggers. Now this is a teeny tiny little model toy clothes peg. It's actually got a spring in there it actually, as you can see, it opens, it closes, it does the job of a clothes peg. Uh, it's got a million uses on the modeling bench. If you're doing um, something that's not a World War One plane and you've got two wing halves and you need to join, normally you need to apply a lot of pressure around that uh, top and bottom of the wing. Just imagine this wasn't a World War One biplane wing, especially on the trailing edges. You know, get a couple of dozen of these little buggers to help you with your gluing operation so that you've got a nice even pressure all the way along the leading and trailing edge around that wing. Um, and that uh, helps ensure that you're not going to be left with unsightly gaps and wiggles in your wing trailing edge that are then a pain to fix up. So get yourself a couple of packets of these things. You can find them at um, craft outlets, um, even the $2 craft outlets. I think uh, Riot Crafts um, went under with COVID but they're very, very readily available online. 
they just timber with a tiny little plastic thing. Um, this one is, uh, let's have a look, it's, um, it's 25 mil, it's an inch, a one inch long clothes peg. So lots of jobs, but specifically for rigging, it's got a really important job. And the really important job is to maintain a gentle amount of tension on your easy line. So um, I'm not actually going to do the whole thing here because I can't think and talk at the same time, but we'll, we'll talk it through. So let's say we're going to rig this little sock with putt biplane. Um, we'd have a bit of a look at where all the rigging lines run. And on most um, single bay, uh, especially British biplanes, um, there's a pretty similar type of operation for most of them. Um, a rigging line starts off somewhere near the front edge or leading edge of the wing. In this case, on the pup, it's actually up on the cowl here. Oh, sorry, I've got to try and position it so you can see it. Yeah, okay. So the rigging line starts around about here, runs up to the top, the leading edge of the interplane strut there, then runs diagonally down between the fore and aft interplane struts. And then from there, it continues on up to, let's see, can you see it? Yeah, the top of the rear cabane strut attaches there, then continues down to the front of the fore cabane strut. So we've actually got one, two, three, four runs that are all going to be done by the one piece of easy line. So we'd start by working out whether the position that the uh, the line starts on is nice and clean. Um, if it's got a bit of paint or glue on it, um, a quick touch up with a tiny little drill to just open that hole out. We're, we're not trying to drill through into the aircraft, just to clean the paint out of the point where the rigging line goes. Then a dot of super glue using your precise applicator, a dot in there, and then using your tweezers, pick up the end of the piece of line. And I would normally cut off a bit of line. I'd kind of just by eye say, oh, I need, to, I need about eight inches for this. So to unwrap about 10 inches, give yourself a bit of slack cutting off so that you can put the spill away and it's not part of the proceedings. Tweezers are really important in this case. Um, I don't know if you can see um, up on my workbench here, we've got a whole selection of different tweezers. Um, and using the right tweezers for the job is really important. The important part is they should have a bend at the end so that you can get them out of your way and see what you're doing. Um, and the most important part is they've got to be reasonable quality. Those points of those tweezers must meet flat. If they meet at a slight angle, what will happen is when you try to pick up the rigging line, the bloody thing will ping off to one side or the other and, and really, really frustrate you. But a good pair of tweezers will let you pick that up and hold it quite precisely, you know, almost like, a, I guess, surgeons use these things um, so that you can then apply it precisely in position. So we've now got our dot of super glue there. It's just a case of holding the line in place. Count three or four seconds. That's usually enough. Be whatever this material is, I don't know whether it's a natural or a synthetic, it um, uh, wicks the glue very nicely and holds it. One trick for young players is you, you do need to hold the line just for those couple of seconds while it's drying. Don't let it flop over because the super glue will wick down the line really, really well. And you'll find that if you were trying to attach the line to this point here and you left the line lying over the cowling, it would whoop, <laughs> glue across the cowling there and your rigging line would come off halfway up the propeller. So just hold it in position for a couple of seconds. Um, if you've got three hands, you could put a drop of a zip kicker on it to set it instantly. But um, I find that um, super glue, I understand, is um, hydroscopic, so it uh, is attracted to water. So just breathing with a warm breath, a gentle breath over the top of it will help it go off in, in a second or two. So we've now got um, our one piece of, of uh, easy line attached to one point of the aircraft. So this is where the fun part happens, the magic happens. I will just cut a bit off to make it easy to move. So now what we've got to do is run the easy line. Let's see if I can get a bit more light on this. Yeah, run the easy line from the point of the cowling up to its first part of the journey, which is around the top of this strut. So I'll see if I can simulate this. So all we do 
Mm -hmm. I'm just going to hold it in the thumb. Is physically run the line up here, drape it over that position where you want it to go. But because there's no tension on it, it's just going to hang loose and limp and be useless. So that's where these beautiful little clothes pegs come in. If I go in and attach a clothes peg to the free end of the line, gravity helps. And that's now pulling that line perfectly taut, but with just you know one or two grams of pressure, it's exactly enough to hold the line where you want it. So you now um, do a little bit of bending and twisting of the aircraft in midair so that the gravity of that peg pulling down helps hold the line where you want it. And when you've got it in position, sometimes you'll find that the line, rather than sitting, rather than sitting right up in here where you want it, it will slide down the strut. So a fix for that is just put a very gentle slice the barest amount of pressure on the top of the strut with a scalpel that'll cause a tiny little slit in the plastic just enough to trap the line in position there it'll as it slides it'll hit the slit and stop and when you've got it in position there just don't breathe for a second pick up a dot of super glue and bang pop it in breathe on it give it a second and that'll set up and now you've got your first line so then it's just a case of continuing with the same piece of line around the aircraft so we've got our line up the top there we're now going to run it down in here so this is where another tool is really really helpful and that tool is a tiny little bit of fuse wire with a hook bent in the end of it so it's almost like a tiny baby little crochet hook the beautiful thing about this is i can take my clothes peg off and I can reach through the aircraft, through all the existing rigging, find that piece of rigging that I'm working on now, pick it up and pull it back through. So you're actually threading it through the aircraft. Um, thread it into position, reapply your clothes peg, he dangles along there, and then you've got the tension for your next run. Make sure it's in position, uh, put a little slit, uh, a little ridge if you want with your knife, Hold for a second, dot of super glue, breathe on it, and let's move on to the next one. And so you can see pretty quickly that, um, especially once you've done it once or twice, um, it can take 10 minutes to do half an aircraft. Um, put that first one in position up to the first, make sure there's a bit of tension on the line, dot of super glue, remove this, reroute the line, put the tension back on it, dot of super glue, A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, and when you get to the final one, that's where a beautiful little quality pair of scissors, I picked these up from Pete the other day, and they're the best I've used so far. Uh, that tip comes down to about a mil or even less than half a mil. You can just get in there and doop, snip it off. You'll often have a tiny little pigtail of rigging line, just that half mil standing out, which won't be seen by anyone except you. But you can then just put another dot of glue next to it and using the tip of a scalp, we'll just press it down into that little bit of glue. Uh, wait for a second. Um, this is actually the most frustrating part because as soon as you touch this, the uh, easy line with the tip of your scalpel, oh, sorry, guys. As soon as you touch the easy line with the tip of the scalpel, the scalpel tip itself will tend to get stuck. And as you try to pull it away from the aircraft, often because of SOD's law, the easy line will stay stuck to the scalpel, not the aeroplane. So sometimes that's a bit frustrating, but just work at it and you'll get there eventually um and you then have you know in in an hour you've got a rigged biplane this one because i've done it half a dozen times uh took about 40 minutes to do the whole airplane and that was stopping to make cups of tea as well um so it, it's all enabled because this material the easy line the properties of that are just so beautiful they're exactly what we want um it has got minimal strength but enough uh beautiful amount of stretch and just the one or two grams of weight from these paper uh, tiny little baby clothes pegs is enough to put exactly the amount of tension you want on it and then a dot of super glue and you're off to your next uh, rigging run it's really really beautiful stuff a um, couple of things you do need to be aware of it's impossible to see uh, even in, in normal eyes but 
this actually isn't a round section, it's a rectangular section. Um, so for people who are quite historically accurate, um, they'll love that because, um, as you know, RAFY, the stuff that the British used, was actually a, a rectangular airfoil shaped uh, rigging wire. It wasn't a round cable. Um, but that means that if you're not careful, um, you can actually get some twists in it. But again, the trick of putting a little bit of uh, tension on it, and as you'll see, that clothes peg is spinning merrily along. It's slowing down now, and once it's found uh, the natural flat bit of the material, it'll stop spinning, and you then know that it's got all of the twists out. So if you do care about it, um, just taking 30 seconds before you use the material to make sure that it's now straight. Um, I only mention it because it is actually visible, um, especially if you look very, very, very carefully. Um, under some light, you can see a twist in the line. Um, so most people won't care. Um, occasionally, um, you'll find a helpful friend who will point out that you've got a twist in your written line. Um, uh, that's what uh, choking is for. But anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, you can take that out. Um, so look, that's that's the technique. It's it's not my technique. Lots I've I read about it on the internet. Oh look, I think for for people who are, um, are keen to get the best scale fidelity out of their kits, this is not the technique to use because of course uh, World War One biplanes weren't rigged by running the line around the tip of the strut. Um, uh, I won't bother trying to show you, but most um, especially RAF machines in World War One. Um, that the strut is a piece of timber. Um, it seats into a socket of metal that's custom made for each application on the aeroplane. And that socket of metal has got little eyelets that come off that the rigging wires attached to. So the rigging wire should actually touch the socket. Um, uh, unlike something like some of the um, uh, kits that will get around, they tend to drill, hole, drill holes in the wing surface and thread through that. Uh, for most aeroplanes, that's not correct. Um, they actually, the wires went down to the sockets that cup the struts. So it, this is close-ish as a technique, but it's not correct. It's it's a, a caricature, it's a cartoon of the effect so that you can see ring wires running on your aeroplane quickly. Um, I also find that um, because the ring line material is a slightly different colour to everything else on the aeroplane. I don't find it an offensive colour, but it is different. What I will often do at the end of the process is I usually put, um, I don't know if you can see this, I usually put a dot of uh, grey or black on the end of my struts uh, to simulate that little metal cup that uh, the timber was run into. And so um, you then have rigging line running across that material. So what I'll do is just go back in with a dot of paint and paint over the rigging material so that it disappears into the cuff and just looks like it's terminating at the cuff. Um, I, I don't think many people would notice it, but I know it's there. So it's it's nice to do that. Um, and look, I've had this one roll. That's 100 feet of easy line. I've had it for probably 15 years. I'm getting close to running out, but red root carry it. So... Um, 20 bucks or so we'll see a reel of that um, running to you and i've made probably 20 25 biplanes um and some of them like this bugger um, used a lot of rigging line um and i'm still on that first roll so it's a very economical um, modeling supply and it does um you know, it's exactly what you want for this job does a great job and um, it's it's what I use to trust. Now, um, uh, people who are more interested in, in scale fidelity, Brad Fallon, for example, um, uses the easy line, but he uh, goes to the extent of putting um, little turnbuckles and termination points and takes far, far, far more time about it. And the, the result pays off. Um, uh, his things look absolutely beautiful. As I said, this is a kind of a caricature, cartoony technique, but um, you know, I'm not after um, first place winners and museum results i'm just after getting you know, reasonable facsimiles of the airplanes into my cupboard and moving on so it works for me um that's pretty much all i wanted to say um questions uh yes jerry um what um super glue are you using um <laughs> the cheapest i can find um this is a two dollar shop um super glue um i think it's two dollars for five or six tubes 
Um, uh, there's another one. Look, I, I don't have a particular brand. It's just whatever I see that is cheap. I think most of these glues probably come out of one or two factories around the world. I know that there are very um, specialist ones, and because I build radio control models, um, I've got um, a whole range of different super glues up in the shed for uh, gluing timber um, for the radio control models, and I've got specialist zaps and zapper gaps and all these other ones. But for these, um, this stuff is absolutely great. Um, a couple of years ago, um, Mike Steins managed to find some super glue. Um, I think Mike Greve might be able to remind me. I think it was um, from those people who do acrylic for false nails. Um, very, very, very thin glue um, that went off really, really quickly. And that was great stuff, but we had two or three tubes of it. And then once that supply went, it was gone. But for this job, the cheap $2 stuff um, works fine for me. And, you know, th there's no emotional attachment. When it clogs up, you can bin it and move on without saying, damn it, that was a $20 bottle of glue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it. Thanks. Um, yeah. All right. uh, Jerry, um, I've got a question from uh, Brendan Backhouse. Uh, he's put on chat. Uh, mm -hmm. He's asking, when starting the line and drilling a hole, do you mm -hmm. apply the glue or ease line first to the hole? Um, once I've got the hole, I put a dot of glue in the hole uh, just because of only two hands. So I'm then holding the model um, to you know, in a position that's comfortable and I'm picking up the easy line with tweezers. Um, I've got my op devices on because I'm blind as a bat and then I just simply apply the tip of the line to the hole with the dot of glue in there, um, count for five, breathe on it and that's usually enough for it to start off. Um, I know um, Brad Fallon mentioned a while ago um, that uh, he is quite a fan of, he'll make a little puddle of um, zip kicker um, off to one side away from his uh, workbench and he'll put a dot of glue in the model, then dip the line into the zip kicker, the accelerator, and then stick it in and it instantly goes off. Um, well, I haven't had success with that technique, just um, I'm, I'm fairly new to using CA accelerators and I find as soon as I have um, any of the accelerator around the workbench, all of the glue in the workbench sets off instantly. <laughs> so, so whether it's the glue on the model or the glue in the little puddle that I'm leaving for, um, so that doesn't work for me, but um, I know Brad does. Yeah. Jerry, uh, it's Bruce. Hello, Bruce. Hi. Look, just a couple of little things. Uh, your your little clothes pegs, mm -hmm. um, they were ones that, that, that's one step further. You see, you get a... <laughs> you get a ladybug. <laughs> ladybug on it. On it. <laughs> Um, on scissors, you were talking about the Fiskars make a, a very fine, uh, where are we, very fine pair of scissors. Oh, that's nice. On that, uh, and that came out of Queen Bien, um, whatever the... the, the, the um, oh, um, Hobby Sale or Spotlight Hobby, or something? Spotlight, yeah. I yeah. found them there. They seem oh, to be nice. pretty rare to be uh, available, but they, uh, they give an excellent little... Very, very yeah. fine. Yeah, just having having them cut right to the edge is what we yeah. need. Yeah, yeah. And the other one you were you were talking about uh, your 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 tube cutting jig. I assume that's mm -hmm. the one that you you're talking about. Oh that's um, no, that, that's a that's a real professional proper one. That's that's from uh, Burfitt's. Bull. Right. So yes. It's got a measure scale on on the on the side. Oh, that's useful. Of it, so you just pick it out, just put it over. And it's got um, diagonal 45 degrees or mm. 90 degrees cut. Well, the um, next time I see Murray, I'll have one of those. Yeah, they're the, that's from Burford Tools. Right. Oh, that looks beautiful. Custom-made tool for the job. Yeah, that's so it's, it's quite uh, quite handy. Yeah, that looks like a good one. On it. And, uh, yes, and I do use it occasionally, so that's <laughs> mm. good. Yeah, no, it looks beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Jerry, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask, mate, when you're doing your undercarriage, because... That's the, Craig. Yeah, sorry, mate. Yeah, Craig, yeah. Um, I find sometimes I need something a bit thicker to provide some structural integrity, mm -hmm. and the easy line just doesn't quite cut it for me. Do you use something different for yours, like monofilament? I, I, or? I, I don't, because um, what I usually do... Um, if the undercarriage looks as though it's dodgy, um, I, I cheat and throw it away and rebuild it out of brass. Oh, um, enough, yeah. 
Yeah, which is probably a little bit of overkill. But um, uh, if, if fellas are interested, um, I can show you very quickly my brass soldering technique. Um, but it's not my technique, it's the technique I used. Um, if you go down to JCAR and um, get yourself a... Uh, oh, which camera are we on? Hang on, I'll switch back. Okay, um, this is a uh, no clean flux pen. So for electronic soldering, it's the duck's nuts because you've got essentially the tip of a felt tip pen in there and you've got a, a nice liquid flux in there. So you can put a dot of flux material um, on your brass and that goes beautifully. But the thing that really makes the technique great is this stuff, which is solder paste so it comes in a syringe um, it's essentially a, a flux with tiny little ground up bits of solder in place so you can get let's just assume this was brass get your two pieces um, align them hold them down in place with a bit of blue tack or a bit of tape or something put a dot of this solder paste exactly where you want it and then just um, wave the flame of one of these um, little creme brulee maker things over that for a second. Uh, that melts the flux, melts the paste, and it goes, <coughs> wicks up, and you've got um, a perfectly strong, for our purposes, joint um, in seconds. So imagine you've got some of that brass that I um, de demonstrated a little while ago, you know, the, the, the 1 mil, the 0.8 mil, the 1.5 mil. Um, it's a relatively simple project to um, sit down and mark out on a piece of paper what um, shape you want your undercarriage to be. You know, I'm going to have a piece that goes down like that, a piece that goes like that. You know, there's the the under the fuselage of the aircraft, so I need this type of shape. Um, get a bit of brass, bend or cut to that position, hold it down with tape, and then wave the flame over, having applied dots of this solder paste in place and very very quickly you get quite a nice strong um, replacement undercarriage piece um, the most complex one i did was for the um the Fokker e3 which has got quite weird looking undercarriage underneath but just by studying it and working out well i can have one piece for the bit that comes down from the aircraft and then there's a bit that goes back and then there's a bit that goes like this and a bit that goes like this um, you can map it all out and it turns out to be two or three bits of brass bend it all up, apply the paste, whoosh, wave the torch over it. And, you know, in a, a pleasant evening, you've got a really strong, resilient thing that can then be married up to the plastic airframe and you know that that's not going to fail um, and it will hold everything for as long as you will. All right. So all right. that, that technique is really good. All right. Thank you for that, Jerry. Uh, Jerry, just... One other thing, um, I've I've got I got some of this super fine black lycra, one from you know, back to front. Um, except I found that it is really uh, it stretches out. It's um, dreadful. I found it dreadful stuff to use. I don't know oh. if you've used it before or if the the EZ. Where did you get that from? That's my. Opinion. Um, the, the EZ is fairly readily available. Um, I know that red Roo models carry EZ at the moment. Um, uh, so um, they're, you know, they're local and they, they come to our meetings occasionally. They, they certainly come to Scalax, so um, they're a, a good mob to support. Yeah. Um, widely available overseas, but red Roo carry it red. in Australia. The Lycra, I haven't tried. I have heard some people say... Um, it can be good in some circumstances, but in others, um, the easy line is just a single piece of material. Um, it's not um, multi parts, not threads. No. Um, and so I know with the Lycra, I believe that it is um, yeah. actually and, at its core multiple pieces. Yeah. And, and so it, it tends to uh, curl up very, very quickly. Yeah, that's my understanding. So, and, so I, I don't think it's as good a material for this job. No, and I'm I'm the, one the, the lycra myself, um, yeah, and the the main uh, problem um, uh, I have with that lycra is actually it's it's softer and curlier than the ease line. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's actually very hard to poke into a hole you drilled. Yes, that's how mm. I sort of looked on the internet and they, they just sort of went, as you said, with your tweezers and you put it in attached bang. I found the Lycra very difficult to try yeah. and attach. Yeah. It was. Yeah, uh, I tried to do the aerials on a Wildcat with it. I ended yeah. up, ended, ended up using monofilament fil line instead because I just couldn't actually poke it into the hole. Mm, yeah. yeah, look, yeah. I've got to admit, since since finding Easy Line, um, it you know it, it is what it says on the tin. It's the best and easiest material to yeah. use for any of these types of jobs. I, I use it for um, aerials on you know like a World War Two fighter um, running between yeah. a couple of points very very easily. Uh, again, just put a tiny little bit of tension on it, uh, drop it down into the super glue, and um, that area was there for good. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing is if you inev inevitably, you know, hit it with your finger while you're picking the model up, it'll just stretch out of the way and then pop back with no change. Yeah. Um, not even enough strength usually to do damage to the aerial mast. And usually those are quite fragile little buggers. Yeah. Um, and it's mm -hmm. fabulous for um, any kind of rigging on um, a boat model. Um, you know, those, those dozens of bloody aerial lines that run across a warship. This is the perfect stuff. Yeah. Uh, again, for the same reasons. Yeah. Now I found that that I I, I gave up on on one of the one and seven hundred <laughs> aerials. Uh, it was just too difficult. Mm. I'm going yeah. to oh, yeah. give oh, really. Lyra another try, but um, yeah, yeah. But uh, seeing Jerry actually uh, let us know the how to solve the problem with the twist on the easy line because mm. that was the main, main motivation for me not using easy line for for my next uh, to do my next bit of rigging but because mm. he's shown me a solution I'll give that a go as well but um yeah uh, yeah but the lycra is still worth what's uh, uh, for me still worth having a go yeah. And, oh yeah, yeah look so, I've got I've got a couple of other materials that I've, I've, I've used in the past um, this one um, is a roll of stuff that I got from Aero Club when they were still around. Um, and I must admit, I've forgotten what it is. It feels similar to the Easy Line. Uh, one big difference, of course, is that it's white. So I use um, it in some instances just in a cartoon fashion. I don't know if you can see in the DH2, the interplane rigging is all Easy Line and it's the sort of dark browny stuff. And then the control lines I made out of the Aero Club fabric, um, just because it looks a bit different and <laughs> visually to the eye. You can say, oh, yes, well, that's obviously the line, that's the elevator control line. Um, yeah. Of course, it's um, a complete uh, uh, whimsy um, on the, in the real aeroplane. Everything would just be a dark metallic colour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, yeah. just Pete, artistic Peter, interpretation. Yeah, Peter's put up their website for Red Roo. They're Mel based in Melbourne, but they do do mail order. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, and there's the easy line there for that. Okay, yeah. Yes, no, the interesting one, I used to have a mate who used to fly tiger moths mm. um, from Tyab down there. And I, I might have told you, uh, our, our score, his score was three cars to David, um, nil to cars. In other words, one day we were taking off down there um, and the two big burly blokes in there, the rate of climb was not particularly good. Um, anyway, the car was going along and he was so busy watching this tiger moth that he didn't see the car in front of him. So, <laughs> needless to say, we uh, we didn't turn around and land. But going Sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Righto. Okay. Well, that's, that's Thank you. Back just... to the uh, question of the Lycra. I don't think this club wants to have people modelling in Lycra. Okay, just <laughs> put it out there. Yeah, there's always one whitey. Drag us down into the gutter. <laughs> yeah, do you reckon we're a bit too old to be mammals? <laughs> yeah. I, I just thought I'd also take the opportunity just to show off a couple, no, a few tools. I mean, one of the ones um, Jerry show, I believe, is one of these pairs of scissors. Mm. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, they... Uh, you know, they, they're quite good as general deckling scissors and, and mm. things like that. Um, um, th th these are tools that we, we, ca we carry, so if you want to ask about them. Um, something Jerry hasn't tried, but I find it, um, uh, especially my lack of technique, find very well. These are tiny little pair of 
uh, now it comes in two versions. It's a scissors and a tweezer. Uh, but, but they hold small things really well. Uh, they were originally marketed for cutting and att uh, attaching photo etch. But um, actually, I find it more, uh, because I don't do an awful lot of photo etch, I find it actually really good for rigging, uh, for mm. cutting very small and delicate decals and things like that. Uh, so that might, they're the sort of tools that might help with your sanity as well when you try to do this. <laughs> Um, and I'm certainly going to use those to attack rigging this. Lovely. So um, I've been waiting for to see Jerry's um, uh, presentation before this weekend start rigging that up. Fantastic. Yeah. Have you got easy line, Pete? I got easy line, but oh, yeah. I'll give spend a few minutes with the uh, Lycra a go first. Uh, but it's, but because you. Yeah, you presented the solution to the, the problem I was worried about with Easy Line. Uh, uh, it probably mean that I can do it with Easy Line as well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll have a go at the 20 minutes, you're not going to. Hmm. Okay. All Anybody right. else with questions? In that case, thanks, boys. Well, yeah. um, yeah. yes, uh, turn off thanks, the record. Jerry. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. Jerry. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, thanks Jerry. That was a very good presentation. Pleasure, people. Yeah, thanks so much for your time, Jerry. Thanks for that. Actually, while we're on the topic of tools, and I heard Spotlight mentioned before when I just ducked off to the toilet, 